I'm going to take you down memory lane here for a little bit. 1963. How many of you are old enough to remember 1963? Not very many. <laughs> it's funny to finally go into the old geezer um, realm of this. So, I'll get my watch here so I can keep on pace. I got a lot to say. You have to listen quite fast. <clears throat> took a Sunday drive. I was about six years old and took a Sunday drive down somewhere. I don't know where to visit a farm. And um, <clears throat> this guy had mobile, mobile shelters. I don't know what he had in them. I don't remember anything about it except what I remember was dad's euphoric enthusiasm driving home of this, this concept of mobile infrastructure. I mean, farms didn't do that. You built a barn, you built a shed, you built a, you know, I mean, good grief, athletics, you built a gym, you build a football field. You, know, you, don't, you don't build portable stuff. And so uh, 1965, a couple years later, my brother is three years older and he's interested in raising some rabbits. And so dad made a, a mobile rabbit, rabbit uh, shelter thing, had a, had a four quadrant uh, core, and then these wings that were basically uh, light, light wooden poultry net cages that would go out like wings on an airplane. Dad flew uh, bombers in World War II in the Navy, so he was on flyboy, so everything, you know, he wants to make an airplane out of it. And, uh, and so, you know, like wings off this thing, and, and every Saturday when he was home from work, you know, we'd move this thing, all of us could pick it up, we could kind of move it, and we'd set the wings back up to the fuselage, you know, and the rabbits could run out. The problem was, rabbits dig, and rabbits run. You can't just chase down a rabbit if it gets out. And so I spent many, many days as a kid with my brother hiding behind the edge of a shed with a long string to a box with a carrot in it, you know, hoping a rabbit would come up and we could pull, pull the prop stick and catch the rabbit. We tried and tried to make that system work and it just wouldn't work. So farmers don't throw anything away. You never know when you might need it, right? And so we take those old wings off, those old uh, kind of, you know, poultry netting light cages things pull them up in the rafters of the barn, and wait. Meanwhile, by now I'm 10, this is, you know, 67, and I get my first chickens from Sears and Roebuck. 50 heavy breed special as hatched. It's always interesting to think about as hatched chicks. There's 32 roosters and 18 pullets. <laughs> That's just the way it is. I never figured out how those hatcheries make those as hatch birds come out like that. They do somehow. I think I'll start a hatchery. That way I'll get rid of a rooster problem. So anyway, um, here we are. It's 19, and and uh, and I had these chickens, and and I had we had a when we come to the place, there was an old uh, 19, you know, 40s, 50s style chicken house out behind the house, and so that's where I had my chickens. And, and uh, now I'm, I'm 13th, 1970, and uh, I've got my little business. I'm selling eggs in the neighborhood, taking them to church, got some customers there, you know. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a born, you know, extrovert talker. Um, Dad always said in the third grade, they went to a parent teachers association meeting, and the, when the teacher found out who he was, she said, Mr. Salton, you have no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> So I needed to expand these chickens, and, and at this point, by this time, I'd had them a couple of years, and you know what the you know what the dirt stationary chicken yard looked like? You know, it was a brick in the summer, and it was a mud hole in the winter, and uh, not pretty. And so I need to expand my chickens. I got my businesses going here, so let's let's, let's get this thing going. And just and Dad said, you know, you know those old rabbit things up in the top of the rafters of the barn. Well, let's pull those down. Let's put them see if we can put chickens in them. And that's how pasture chickens were born. That's their indifference. You know, everybody. <laughs> it these great ideas come when, you know, focus groups sit around and, 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 and deal with something. But no, they, they generally just come, you're just, you're just, on the trajectory of life, you're doing things, and and necessity breeds invention, and you know, and you just you just make something work. So, uh, so 
So that's what we did. And, uh, and in 1975, then graduated from high school. I had, by the time I was out of high school, I had 300 layers and had this very thriving uh, business, supplying a couple of restaurants, a couple of schools, uh, numerous customers, and everything. Shut it down to go to college. When I came home from uh, college, then you know the, the chickens were gone, and, and I started working at the, at the local newspaper. And uh, but I'm, I'm thinking, how do I how do I get back to the farm full time? I really wanted to farm full time. How do I do this? Dad was an accountant, mom was a school teacher, and uh, we've done a lot of experiments on the farm. We built, by that time, we built the portable shade mobile. We were, that uh, was for the cows, and, and, uh, and I'd, I'd pull these you know, chicken shelters along in the, in the summer uh, out there, and, and uh, how, how, how do we do this? Well, one of Dad's accountants, one of Dad's uh, clients, and accounting clients was a Mennonite couple who always raised a, a couple hundred broilers Kind of in their backyard uh, every year, and their idea was, can we can we get free chicken? So they'd sell enough to pay a feed bill and basically get their chickens for free. Well, they were getting elderly; they wanted to get out of it, and they asked all around the Mennonite community. You know, nobody wanted to take their take their little thing. They had about you know a dozen customers, and uh, and uh, I had I had made the leap in 1982 to leave the newspaper and come back to the farm full time. And uh, we were, you know, we were struggling. It was, you know, it was like we drove a fifty-dollar car, lived in the attic of the house, lived on three hundred dollars a month. And if we didn't grow, we didn't eat it. We never went anywhere. And uh, and so, 1983, you know, the nest egg started to run out, and we're starting to, you know, get a little bit low on the pan there. And and uh, this couple approached me and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in this? Well, I got some time. I hadn't had chicken since I'd gotten back from college. I said, hey, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, and, and I'm not scared to butcher chickens, and so, uh, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll raise them. So they gave me their you know, 12 customer list, and I got the chickens and raised them up and, and uh, sold them and, 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 and had put them in the old layer shelters that I pulled up in the, in the, in the uh, rafters of the shed when I went to college and pulled them back down, put the broilers in them now, not layers, and there we go, uh, and started raising these chickens. And we were there full time, and uh, of course started direct marketing. In, uh, then in 88, uh, I was with a friend, and we were at a farm buying a bull. I was helping him to decide what bull to buy. And, um, and uh, it was the year dad died in 88. And uh, on this, this, this farm ante room here, there was a little magazine rack. And I saw this magazine sitting there, Stockman Grass Farm. And I just picked it up. I was, he and, he and the other guy were wheeling the deal in the other room. I had, my consulting was done by this time, you know, and I was just cooling my heels in this ante room. Picked this thing up, thumbed through it, and I, this is, this is me. This is us, you know. So I, you know, grabbed a piece of paper there off the desk and wrote down the information, immediately subscribed, and, uh, and uh, we had, we had that year or second year, I was president of the Virginia Biological Farmers Association uh, because I was on a farm full time, so I had, I had time. And, uh, and I was president of VABF. Well, it was the president's obligation every year to host the, for the, the state um, annual meeting. And so we did, and uh, a columnist uh, for Stockman Grass Farmer found out about it, came down from Pennsylvania. Roger Wintling was his name. He worked for the uh, NRCS in Pennsylvania. Great guy. His column was uh, Roger Went Grazing. And he came down to the little uh, shit dig we had there, wrote a column about it for Stockton Grass Farmer. Next thing I know, the phone rings, Alan Nation calls it, can I come and see you? I mean, this is the founder, editor of Stockton Grass. You know, I'm just a little, you know, nothing down there. And uh, absolutely. So he comes up and uh, visits and uh, says, can you start, you know, can you start writing a column for us in Stockton Grass? And you're the, you're the one I've been looking for all over this country. And you're finally, you know, finally found me. So I started the pastoralist column there. And by 1990, uh, Stockton Grass had their first conference in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And I uh, went and spoke there and the, the, the floodgate started opening up. He started getting asked to speak around about this, this, this chicken thing. And, we were starting to get some media exposure and, and, and this you know, young couple with no money and, and uh, just you know, starting this thing from scratch and being able to make a living on a small farm 
uh, without government handouts and, and, and all this and, and just kind of bootstrapping it. And, uh, and the thing just, and the phone started ringing, started ringing off the hook. You know, people all around the country, how do you do this pasture poultry thing? How do you do this pasture poultry thing? And I would I'd work all day out on the farm, come in at night and have six messages of people. Okay, take a piece of paper, draw a rectangle. 10 feet, 12 feet, you know, and I'm doing this every night. I told Teresa, I said, I can't, I can't spend two hours on the phone every night talking to these people all over the country about this pasture poultry thing. So, you know, fortunately I had, you know, been into the paper, I had a journalistic background, and so I said, well, why don't I, I'll, I'll, I know what I'll do, I know what I'll do. Talk about naive. I'll write a manual, and that'll stop all the phone calls. <laughs> Then everybody can just get this manual, they can do it, and we won't have to actually be fun. So, uh, so I wrote the little, how many of you have ever seen the Pasture Poultry Manual, 1991? Anybody here? Yes, we've got uh, Bev and, and Dave, my old uh, comrades here. Yeah, okay. Once in a while, somebody will bring one up. They're still, um, we, sold, we sold about uh, a thousand of them uh, in 91, 92, through Stock and Grass Farmer Magazine, only through there. And, uh, and in 93, Alan, to show how, how magnanimous he was, he said, listen, he said, uh, you, gotta, you gotta turn this into a real book. The, you know, the manual's fine, it was a little Xerox copied uh, bratted thing on the edge, you know, you flip over little diagrams in it. And they said, you need, to, you need to make this into a book. He said, either we'll publish it for you or we'll help you self-publish, but, uh, but you, need, you need to actually make this into a book. So 93, Winter of 93, I sat down with a typewriter, and uh, this is before computers, and typed out the Pasture Poultry Profits. And uh, after he told me the financials of it, I decided to self-publish. So you're not gonna get all this. And so, uh, you know, once a value adder, one, you know, always a value adder. And, uh, so, so, uh, so we printed Pasture Poultry Profits, and printed uh, a thousand of them. And that winter, that fall, I actually don't remember where it was, but uh, I was in a hotel room with Skip Polson of Effort Project International, Diane Kaufman, and I don't remember maybe one or two others, in a hotel room somewhere. I was at a, at a, uh, by this time I was starting to speak a little bit around different conferences and things, and we conceived of the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association, and through the efforts of Skip Polson, especially with Effort Project International, um, with his expertise through HBI, I was able to was able to launch uh, Appa Papa, <laughs> and that was a big deal there in '93, kind of the same year the, the, the book came out. And then <clears throat> the next year we got a visit from the food police. You know, it never occurred to me, and this is how I'm talking about naive. It never occurred to me that it would be illegal for me to raise a chicken, butcher it in the backyard, and sell it to a neighbor. Why would that be illegal? Why would anybody care? Why wouldn't everybody say, oh, that's cool? But uh, some people did care, they're called bureaucrats. <laughs> and, uh, that year we learned, and fortunately we had a, so they came to visit us. We'd been turned in and uh, came to visit us and had the nicest elderly guy in charge of meat poultry inspection in Virginia at the time. And um, he came, he spent a day with me. I showed him all over the farm. When he got down, he sat in the living room. He said, man, I wish I'd have met you when I was 20. He said, if I had, I think I'd have stayed on the farm and made a business of it. <laughs> he said, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have a clue, and so I went to work for the government. And uh, he was as magnanimous as he could be, gave us our PL, that's when I learned about PL 90-492, and we became Virginia exemption number 1001, the first one in Virginia. And, uh, and with the 20,000 bird exemption, and he left and all was well and it was, it was good for three years. And then he retired and he was replaced by a much younger man who was a much more aggressive bureaucrat who came and said, everything that the nice 
elderly gentleman had told us was wrong and we were criminals and we needed to shut down immediately. And uh, that, was, that was involved with a couple of other things too, custom beef and other things and all that. Uh, so when people talk about, you know, that I'm, that I rang along the government a little bit, I'll tell you, you know, um, you know, this was our livelihood. We were there full time, loving it. We had customers who loved it. And uh, we had all of our fall beef impounded with police tape at the slaughterhouse with accusations. And people on the door waving their big badges looked like FBI, but it said, you know, um, Food Safety Inspection Service. And unless that's ever happened to you, you don't appreciate what that feels like to have your whole life, your vocation, your dreams, your fantasies. And it was interesting. It was like it was like uh, it was like a repeat. You know, at that time, I was you know 35, 36, 37, and. My dad was 39 in Venezuela when a junta took our farm in Venezuela. I was four, and we were forced to flee Venezuela in a, a coup d'etat, a junta, and the machine guns came in the back door and we went in the front door, or left, and lost everything. Dad had been there 12 years. He loved the people, loved the language, loved the culture. That was gonna be his life. He was 39 and lost it all, and came back, started over on a gully rock pile, the armpit of the community in Virginia. He never got over it. And I thought at this house about that same age. And we were being told we might lose the whole thing. Something how those things happen. And I remember kind of being out in the field, moving chicken shelters. We used to call them pens until the animal welfare people told us they were penitentiaries. So we started calling them, I was thinking pens like play pens, like kids, play pens, a nice safe place to play. You know? So now we call them shelters, so we don't get you know, uh, tired up with that. But I was out there moving shelters. There, 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 there are a few things I think as therapeutic as moving chicken shelters. You know, early in the morning, the dew is sparkling in the grass, the sun's rising, the birds are singing, um, and you're getting your exercise, and it's, it's a very meditative thing. And you're making thousands of beings happy as they scramble for the fresh grass, and the grasshoppers, and the crickets, and digging for some fresh worms, and, and uh, who gets to wake up every morning and make that many beings happy that much, watching them dance, and and get their new paddock. And, and uh, it was an audible voice, but I can tell you this, as I was just thinking through all this, we were facing uh, some pretty serious stuff, and, and uh, it was just like a voice came out of heaven and said, uh, out of the book of Esther in the Bible, uh, you know, when Mordecai tells Esther, risk your life to save the Jews, and she goes in before the king and, 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 and put your life on the line, and what Mordecai say to her, Esther, for such a time as this, for such a time as this. And that just was a powerful, profound moment for me and I'll never look back. It was like a confirmation, affirmation, go for such a time as this, you are here. You are here to lead people to stewardship, to caretaking of the land and to moving our world to a better place. So we got through that. Then, <clears throat> then the chickens started dying. What's the problem here? And uh, we found fur trail. Fur trail was a lifesaver. I'd written, you know, it's pretty, it, it, it's really sobering. You've written a book. You're in the Smithsonian Magazine. You know, you're the darling of, of all this media attention. And then you, you wake up one morning and you say. I don't know if we can continue this. 
It's a big deal. And what had happened was that the meat and bone meal that we'd always used in the chicken ration had always been pork or beef. But as the vertical integrated poultry industry, Tyson, Purdue, Car as that industry came on, you started not being able, you couldn't go down to your feed store and buy beef meat and bone meal, pork meat and bone meal, or chicken meat and bone meal from the chicken. They started combining it all. You could only get one meat and bone meal, and as the chicken industry developed, the, 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 the amount of chicken meat and bone meal in meat and bone meal was higher and higher and higher, and the beef and the pork component was smaller and smaller and smaller. So here we were, unvaccinated, unmedicated chickens, feeding meat and bone meal as a, as a rendering, you know, salvage thing from the industry. And the chickens couldn't take it. Now we didn't have all this put together at the time. I was just starting to formulate these ideas. What we knew was the chickens were, were, were not healthy. They were not dying. We're not putting weight on them. They were, they were, they were struggling. We, I mean, back to where, can we raise these chickens anymore? And I was out actually speaking at a conference, promoting pasture chickens with this gnawing on my mind, okay? And a lady came up to me and said, you ever heard of fur trap? No, I never heard of it. So well, try them out. In the meantime, Jerry Brunetti, how many of you remember Jerry Brunetti? Wonderful, wonderful fellow. He was showing these electron microscopic uh, photographs of GI tracts of various animals and the difference with the way the GI tract metabolized minerals, vitamins, and, and, and all nutrients based on mineral intake. And his basic thesis was that it, it, it's the mineral component that determines how much nutrient an animal can metabolize out of its food source. And uh, so that happened about the same time. I said, well, I'll, I'll try this fur trail thing. So we ran an experiment. At that time, there was a guy here in Texas. He's not in business anymore. Uh, uh, buying big ads in Acres USA called uh, Immunoboost. I mean, it was an elixir fixer going to fix everything, you know. So we bought some Immunoboost. We bought some Willard's water. Uh, it was a catalyst altered water, CAW, uh, from uh, Dr. Willard. He was a mineralogist and developed this and fur trail. And we did an experiment. And fur trail and Willard's water won. So we changed our ration and went and, and it was we were able to get away from the meat and bone meal and went to the and went to fur trail and went to a, a non-meat and bone meal uh, uh, ration. But Willard's water had been so good, I thought, man. If we combine fur trail and Willard's water, we might grow Jack and a Beanstalk. You know, we might. <laughs> and so we, uh, so we ran, we, then we ran experiments doing those head to head. And we didn't get any benefit from the Willard's water. Um, and a, a naturopathic doctor fixed me up on that. I said, well, what's going on here? You know, we, we get nothing here. We, we've got big changes and suddenly now we're not getting any changes. What's, what's the deal? So, well, you know, in Western medicine, we, 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 we view, um, Wellness is up here, sickness is down here, and there's this linear line, you know, you're somewhere from sickness and wellness and you're on this line, you know, but that's not the way it is because you, if you're well, you can't get any well, you know, you, you can't get well forever. And so he said, actually, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a you, it's a, it's a horseshoe. Sickness is down here, wellness is up here, and you're either coming up or you're going down, and what, and what got you from sick to well on this side, if you continue it, it can often tip you down the other side into sickness again. I mean, a perfect example is uh, you've got an infection, you take antibiotics, you're over here, you're sick, you get well, you continue taking them, and now uh, you become an addict. Are you with me? Okay. And so he said, said, what you've got is your chickens are well, you give them something that gives them well. We had the same experience with, um, we, we've done this numerous times, uh, with, uh, we used hydrogen peroxide. So you remember the big craze hydrogen peroxide? Everybody's using hydrogen peroxide. Man, food grade hydrogen peroxide, 35%. I mean, it just, you know, it's the cat's meow and does everything. We did it, didn't do anything. Um, then there was a guy, full, full page ads in Acres USA. Every issue was uh, a product called NutriCar, Leonard Ridson. Man, remember, remember him? Full page ads all the time. Got a barrel of uh, NutriCar, Leonard Ridson. Put it in a ration per specs, killed half the chickens. 
<laughs> we're back to this, this, this horseshoe, okay? Chickens were well, we gave them something that was, a, that was an aggressive detoxicant and sent them down the other side. So, um, so fur trail was a, big, was a big deal. And then now we're, in, uh, now we're up to you know, 96, uh, up around 2000. Um, infrastructure began developing by 2000. By 2000, we started getting infrastructure. When we, when we bought our first feather picker in, in uh, whatever, 1980, about 87, 89, 85, I guess. 85, we bought a, a, our first feather picker. We got it from a, an outfit called Pickwick. And um, at the time, this was a, you know, a, drum, a drum picker. And at the time, they were making 12 a year. And they were one of two companies, them and Ashley. Those were the only two companies that made small scale home processing, uh, poultry processing equipment. And, um, and they were doing 12 a year. So about 2000, here comes you know, Dave Schaefer and Featherman, and you get uh, the, uh, the, the whiz bang, the do-it-yourself whiz bang, and, and, and others. And the infrastructure began developing okay, around us. And now, now we've got this, this NASA thing going on. Meanwhile, Appa Papa, we're, we're meeting. Uh, we, we, we piggyback on Acres conferences. We piggyback on Stockman Grass conferences. We piggyback on PASA. Um, uh, you know, other things are going on. And there's 20 or 30 of us sitting in a room and we're, you know, well, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we move forward? What do we do? And, uh, and so then by 2010, we've got, you know, we've got the, the, some, some, you know, some serious uh, production going on, bigger people. Uh, coming in, you know, Pasterberg, things like that. And by 2020, uh, during the from 2010 to 2020, I'm going fast now. Uh, by that time, now we have plant in the box and, and other things. And then, you know, Pasterberg gets bought by Purdue. And suddenly, that brings us to 2020, and we have a black swan event called COVID. COVID. For the first time in my lifetime, I saw extended empty store shelves. People were actually talking about starving. We had people in our sales building who were very upfront and said, I would never have come to a farm to buy food, but I gotta eat. So I'm coming to where the food is. And most of us in this business sold about a year's worth of stuff in six weeks in the spring of 2020. It was a, it was a black swan. Um, it woke people up. It, uh, there were a million backyard flocks started in 2020. Hatcheries couldn't supply the chicks. Canneries, uh, there were 10 years worth of canning lids sold in 2020 compared to previous. Think about that. You couldn't buy seeds. Gardening companies, seed companies, couldn't supply the demand. In October 2020, the number one Googled, um, you know, Google it, find it. The number one search in October 2020 was how to make sourdough bread and make sourdough starter. What I'm getting at is this black swan affected our culture big time. And then in 2022, we get another black swan. Putin invades Ukraine. Fertilizer spikes 400%. Think about that. Grain prices escalate. And now we have high path avian influenza with 58 million birds destroyed and more on the way. And it's certainly not over. Egg prices. How many times in your life have you seen eggs be on the front page of the media news? <laughs> I mean, now, egg smuggling across the Mexican border is bigger news than people. <laughs> <laughs> Hatcheries are overbooked. You trying to buy chicks lately? Hatcheries are booked. Inflation and high grain prices. We live in exciting times. So, quickly let me run through the meat of this. 
I wanted to walk down memory lane because a lot of people haven't heard it. You don't know the story. Sometimes it's good to just look behind the curtain. You know what I'm saying? So it's been, it's been a fun, fun go. All right, so our position. Our position, number one, is resilience versus efficiency. We are now seeing a revival of our whole Western world using the word resilience instead of efficiency. Those of us who've been preaching resilience and resilience and really have been kind of marginalized and, and kind of you know patted on the head and oh you know that's nice but it really doesn't feed the world da, 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 da. and and here comes along these black swans that suddenly make us realize that if we don't first have resilience there's nothing to be efficient about and in fact somebody did a word search for the uh, for Parliament in the Great Britain over the last five years and found out that the word resilient or resilience is, has now doubled in usage in parliamentary debates and the word efficient and efficiency has dropped by half. That's telling. That's telling. So what we're about at APA is we're about, we're on the side of trying to create a functional immune system through sanitation, hygiene, through a completely different production model. And we, and we understand scale. We understand that when things, supply chains break and, and, and efficiency overrides resiliency, it is the ability to adapt that makes the winners and not the losers. You know, there's a, there's a business book out. It's not the big that eats the small, it's the fast that eats the slow. And so as we move into this new business time, it's important to understand that the winners are going to be driving speedboats, not aircraft carriers. If you're trying to navigate disruptive shoals and stay off the rocks, you don't want an aircraft carrier, you want a speedboat. I'm a Wall Street Journal addict, sorry. They just had a fascinating article last week. Listen to this. Service problems at Union Pacific Corporation, that's a railroad in case you didn't know, have sparked a dispute between the railroad and one of the country's biggest chicken processors, which says the lives of millions of birds are endangered by repeated delays in the delivery of corn. California-based Foster Farms has asked for regulatory intervention for the second time in six months, saying delayed shipments from Union Pacific have dwindled its corn inventory. The company said it has diverted feed from dairy cattle to the chickens, which are susceptible to quicker death. The point has again been reached where hundreds of thousands of dairy cattle are not being fed, and when millions of chickens will starve to death because of UP service failures, Foster Farm said in a December 29 filing with the Surface Transportation Board, the economic regulator overseeing the country's freight railroads. Now, I don't know where your problems are, but listen to this. <clears throat> While the privately held company, Foster Farms, has sought alternative sources of corn, as well as trucks to alleviate the shortage, because they can't get it on the, on the railroads, it says these are insufficient because about 400 trucks are needed to transport the volume of corn that one train would carry. So how would you like to deal with that supply issue? And so what happens is, many of you are seeing it right here. Right now at our farm, our eggs are cheaper than they are in the store. Our T-bone steak's cheaper than it is at Costco. Um, Tyson raised their beef prices 32% in the last 12 months and going up more. The fact is that these black swan events in our culture so upended business and HR departments and, and quarantine protocols that these great big scaled quote unquote efficient operations became unbelievably fragile in the face of these black swans. And so those of us who have a better immune system in our animals, in ourselves, 
have smaller outfits. You know, I don't wake up every morning worried, oh no, who in Quadrant 5 is going to sue us for not having the right pro uh, a quarantine protocol and enough plexiglass barriers in between everybody. I don't get up every morning to worry about that, see? But let me tell you, CEOs all over the country with big businesses, they do. And when you're in a mega processor with 5,000 people in a cold, dark, damp environment with people crammed 20 to a room because they're trying to get their friends and family enough money to get here as well. And so they're living on salami and Roman noodles to save money to send it so their folks can pay a coyote to get here. And I'm not trying to be disingenuous. This is the reality. And you're under that stress because you're you're away from your wife and your kids because you're trying to provide a better home for them and you're crammed into a dark, cold, uh, uh, dreary, 5,000 person place with a bunch of blood and guts and manure in, in the air all day. That's a fragile environment. Much different than those of us who butcher chickens a day or two a week with a crew of five or 10 in a very, either open air or, or quite, you know, open, smaller, smaller space. Are you with me? And so that, that creates, the, 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 the scale actually bogs down the big players. It, it becomes carbon on the valves, if you were talking about an engine, all right? It mucks up things. The scale actually becomes a detriment, not a asset. And so we at APA, we believe, that scale is not achieved by centralization, where you mega size, centralize, and confine everything. We believe scale is achieved by duplication. And so, for example, the Alexanders don't have don't have a a, a hundred thousand bird factory chicken house. <coughs> they have fifteen three thousand bird flocks in different spread over. You with me? I mean, that's an extreme example of us. They're, you know, way up there. But, but all of us, we don't, we don't get to where we want to go simply by scaling up the infrastructure and centralizing the infrastructure. We duplicate, we duplicate the models that we have. Our position number two is about participation versus convenience. You know, we have been told in our culture for the last, you know, uh, 50, 60, 70 years that freedom and liberty come from, from freeing yourself from the drudgery of chores. Let somebody else grow your food. Let somebody else uh, be in the kitchen. You can get squeezable Velveeta cheese, Hot Pockets, and Lunchables, and that'll give you more time to watch TikTok and Netflix, and you will be free. And you don't have to raise chickens or have compost. You can buy chemical fertilizers from somebody else and you can let somebody else process your food and, and, and you don't have to participate in all those drudgeries that are called chores and the less academic people do. And suddenly, here we have these two black swan events or three if you want to count avian influenza. And suddenly, there's this new awareness. Oh, true freedom comes from participation. Those of us who continue to plant gardens, grow our food, cook our food, can our food, create a larder, and we're participating in the humdrum of life. When the shelves went empty, we had food. When the fertilizer jumped 400%, we didn't have to buy it. When Ukraine couldn't ship wheat, we didn't buy it because we were getting GMO from local uh, uh, GMO-free farmer neighbors. Because we had built resilient, supposedly inefficient systems. And so I would submit that, that, that it is the participation. It is the participation in the fundamentals of life that actually yield the liberty. We've been promised, oh, you can, you can unmoor yourself from the fundamentals of life, and that's the way you really have liberty. 
And now we know that's not true. Number three, our position is faith versus fear. You know, uh, uh, our, our nation is now peddling fear porn every day. Nature's default position is wellness. We figured it was not well. We probably messed it up somewhere. And so we go forth in faith that nature's idea, that chickens run out into pasture, they get sunlight, they, you know, uh, that th they, they will be fine if we provide them a great environment to live in. And as far as food regulations, we, you know, generally, businesses to think that, that you know, we believe business is more trustworthy than bureaucrats. And the shorter chains of custody and relational marketing and transparency equal a more safe food system than one managed by bureaucrats and checkoff boxes. Overcoming our problems doesn't require labs and patents as much as observation and experiential adaptation, which is exactly what this conference has put up, has put forth. That agriculture, we go forth with the faith versus the fear that agriculture is healthy if we have mobile models, so we don't need to buy land. You can, you, you can have mobile infrastructure. You can, you can use it on rented land. You can build your farm on, on uh, collaborative land that is modular, which means scale is a duplication. And, you can, and, and, and modular means that you can get in with your own cash flow and you can, and you can, uh, you know, you can increase the modules. And management intensive. Management intensive meaning, yeah, does it take labor to move these things and, and keep the mobility going? Yes, it does. But you know what? That means our equity is in knowledge, skill, and customers. And nobody can ever foreclose on your knowledge or put a lien on your mastery. So our equity moves from stuff to non-physical. That doesn't have to be borrowed from the bank. And now we have a way in for all the young people and the people ready to flee their urban prison and come to the country and start feeding all the other people that don't know that it's a problem. And finally, number four, our position is that we believe in investment versus subsidy. That food is fundamentally an investment institution. Cheap, a cheap food policy runs on politics and unfair interventions. We don't externalize our costs. We're not going to give anybody MRSA and C. diff with high fat with uh, uh, you know, super buds from antibiotics. We offer superior nutrition. That's been proven over and over again in period with anybody that's, that's doing uh, testing for nutrition, eggs, chicken, whatever. We build soil. Well, if you want to build soil, when people are always asking me, you know, we've got this place, we've got this poor pasture, we've got to put chickens on it. I mean, you want to paint a pasture green, you want to build soil, there's nothing like chickens. We can germinate more farmers, new farmers, and create beautiful landscapes because our model doesn't dominate the landscape, it's embedded in the landscape. One of the most beautiful things I think about pasture poultry is when you think about industrial commercial agriculture, what dominates the landscape is what, what mankind, the infrastructure, the things we have done to the landscape. It, it dominates the landscape, the big you know, Tyson chicken house, the big you know, uh, cattle feedlot, whatever. What we do so embeds and nests into the landscape, it looks like it belongs there. And so the thing that strikes you as you run down a landscape that we offer, it's a landscape that you see the trees, the grass, listen to the birds, and oh yeah, they're, they're farming there. That's the way I like it. Where what God's done gets the glory, and what we've done gets second best. Where we're, we're nested, we're nestled into that womb, that landscape, and it's what people, what people see and what we, what we do is secondary. So that's our position. How about our problems? Our problems, number one, is marketing. Marketing. We can produce this stuff. What we need are intentional consumers that actually are willing to buy what they say they want. And so we have to message that. We have to message so that it is attractive to them, getting people to walk the talk, 
You say you believe in this, you say you believe in nutrition, you say you believe uh, you know, animal welfare, these kind of things. Well, put your money where your mouth is and quit going to McDonald's. We'll know, we'll know that we've changed things when McDonald's goes bankrupt. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> we can produce, that's not a problem. The problem is the hurdles in the market. The, the second problem we have is processing. You know, burdensome regulations are still prejudicial. Um, and, 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 and even, even the ones, you know, when we get there, the human friendly model, you know, we need processing that works financially small enough so that somebody doesn't have to kill animals there every day. And it's interesting to me that all the animal welfare, humane society, uh, uh, people in the, in the world, they, they don't address any of the, of the inhumanity of a, of a processing plant that only works financially if somebody's there killing animals every single day. You know, even the Levites didn't do that. Uh, they, they drew straws. And so I don't think it's I don't think it's it's humanly psychologically good. So we need we need to be able to do our processing at a scale that allows people to do other things, use different muscles, and and and, and preferably be part of the production team as well as the execution team. That's good for the psyche to have some life along with your death. The capital required for processing, for infrastructure, for hazard compliance, and all that. Is uh, the, 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 you know, the, the problem is overall we're you know, around system through a square hole. The third uh, problem we have is distribution, logistics of small volume transport, just the, the cost of small volume transport, uh, compliance to get on delivery trucks, uh, insurance protocols to be able to get on a, you know, a U.S. Foods or a, or a Cisco truck, uh, seasonality, uh, finding patrons who can handle different weights and, and, and fresh versus frozen. Those sorts of things. Collaboration to help each other uh, through shortfalls, north, south, you know, uh, for, for that kind of product. And uh, inventory capacity and cold storage. You know, these, are, these, these are all problems that we're, that we're dealing with. But let's finish with our possibilities. Our possibilities. One possibility as we go forward is a regional comprehensive system of hatchery. So imagine this. Imagine, imagine a hatchery. Uh, that would select chickens on the basis of how orange the yolk is. You know, we run these eggmobiles, these pasture chickens, all that are laying eggs. You know how it is. You, you, know, you crack out five or six, you know, nice, good, golden, and, and then you get this pale, pale egg. You know what that is? That's a lazy chicken. <laughs> That's a lazy, she's not going out scratching bugs and eating grass. She's just lounging around the, you know, I, I go, I move the megamobile, I go open it up, open the door, all the chickens, you know, they run out. I go in and open up the nest boxes. There's 15 or chicken, 20 chickens in there. Why? Why are you in here? I just opened up, there's grasshoppers and crickets and fresh grass and clover leaves out there. And what are you doing hanging in there around the feet? You bunch of loafer. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> yeah. So, so what we what we need to do is, is is be cultivating chickens that actually work on pasture, that actually metabolize what we're trying to do, uh, feed. You know, uh, it, 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 some of us are able to get GMO free, and some of us aren't. That sort of thing. But my goodness, we need to push that grain thing on through to where we actually have ecological grain production where we're using farm, where we're using grain that uses the crimping, the push down, the, the, the stuff that Rodale Institute has developed, pasture cropping with call and size, where it's not, you know, it, it's a complete ecological system on our on our feed grains. That's probably one of our Achilles heels in the in the broader debate right now is that we we pasture poultry people have not been aggressive at getting our grain sources to also be ecological. I mean, we've, you know, we've done a lot, done what, you know, where we are, but that's kind of, that's kind of the next step. Um, uh, processing, you know, uh, we just need a lot more processing capacity, a lot more doing it. I, I agree with Dave Schaefer, he says that, you know, a picker, a picker should be as much a part of the landscape of America as a lawnmower. Imagine if we had as many chicken pickers as we had lawnmowers. We wouldn't even have Tyson. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, distribution needs to be worked on. Collaborative things like that. 
So uh, where I'm going here is, and I think that a lot of times, rather than trying to change the system, we need to simply build a new alternative system. Just build an alternative universe all the way through, including marketing outside everything. And so, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Rogue Food Conference that John Moody and I started several years ago. We're having our sixth, uh, our sixth uh, uh, conference uh, this spring. But Rogue Food Conference is highlighting all the people in the country who have simply looked at the, regulatory, the food regulatory, the food police, and said, forget it, we're going to circumvent it. Because at some point, circumvention becomes more efficient than compliance. So you spend a lot of time trying to comply, comply, comply. Sometimes uh, a circumvention is better. And so we've got we've got DC Bali's uh, food church. We've got um, we've got uh, um, you know, her uh, a meat share. We've got um, the the PMAs, the private membership associations. Um, uh, we've got a, we've got a, a butchering um, butchering seminars via the internet, so a customer can. Can pay to have a uh, to see the butchering as a butchering seminar, and they get free meat. See, you can give stuff away, you just can't sell it. So these are all very clever mechanisms to not have our our stuff in commerce where the bureaucrats have jurisdiction. They just come out of commerce, uh, commerce you know. And and so you know, I think I think these are continuing areas that we're going to continue to develop. Uh, number two possibility: uh, a national voice for pastured poultry. Uh, you know, I, this has been a, a dream of mine from uh, day one. You know, I, wouldn't it be cool if every time poultry, eggs, avian influenza is in the news in the nation? Nobody at any national media would dare to run a story until they talked to Apple and get our take on whatever whatever the situation is. That would be cool. Steady flow of press releases, national media presence to offer an alternative view, and a bigger membership and aggressive presence. And finally, number three, our possibility is a stability and dependability within the food system. Right now, our food system, there are people uh, that are really feeling um, fearful about our food system. I mean, I've had people come to the farm store and say, how can I buy food insurance from you? We got fire insurance, auto insurance, medical insurance, life insurance, you know, all you, who's ever heard of food insurance? But that's how, that's how fearful people are getting. And so we offer, APA, we offer that stability and dependability within the food system because of our resilience, our immune systems, and our, our decentralized our decentralized focus and the model that we espouse. And so we're providing function versus dysfunction. We're providing health versus sickness. We're providing abundance versus scarcity. Scarcity. We're providing beauty versus ugliness. Don't walk inside of a CAFO. We're providing safety versus risk and nutrition versus depletion. Our objective, our goal here you can make a list of all the things that you're angry and frustrated about, and you know, that might be therapeutic to do that. But at the end of that list, I want us all to pledge ourselves to turn it upside down so that after we have our little anger, frustration tantrum, we realize that our real objective and what energizes us and moves us forward is to provide hope and help when all around us are hopeless and helpless. So that we're building an ark while half the world doesn't even know it's raining. And that's okay. That's okay. The ones that know it's raining will come to our ark. But they're looking for a builder to build that ark. And APA in the poultry space is that ark. I congratulate you, I honor you, every one of you who has chosen to be a leader and has taken the frustration that we can all, you know, wallow in <laughs> over the last couple of years and turn it into a positive catalyst to be a lighthouse of hope and help when all around us become hopeless and helpless. Are we ready for that? 
Yeah. Let's do it. May all of your carrots grow long and straight. May the radishes be large but not pithy. May tomato blossom in rot affect your Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. <laughs> May the coyotes be struck blind at your pasture chickens. May all of your culinary experiments be delectably held. May the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise and call you blessed, and may we all make our nest a better place than we found. Thank you for coming. Thank you for letting me be with you. Bless you. Bless all of your endeavors. And may we change the world with our ark. God bless you.